online learning platform that was launched to find itself in terms of how it wasn't a MOOC. It was a FOOP or a SPOOP or a LOOP or a, you know, some other MOOC. And uh, it was an interesting time. Middle trends uh, are, are important. They grow in importance the slower they are, I think. So the, the really slowest moving trends, a good example would be mobile. We've been seeing mobile be an important trend in our work for more than six years, seven or eight years, really. Um, and it continues to be important every year, and every year for different reasons, because it's converging with a lot of other technologies. But one thing we know about mobile is we can project that in five years it'll still be important, which we can't say about moves, and that's kind of the difference in, in there. So just to give you a peek of some of the trends that will be in the European report, is we see two really fast trends. Um, and this, just because they're fast doesn't mean they're going to not be important, but I think that it does uh, come with some leadership implications because uh, they may be moving too fast for, for institutions to change it quickly. But one is the growing importance of social media. Um, as you look around the world, it really is impacting the way that people are thinking about informal education, certainly. And I'm going to talk about it more and talk a little bit later. But also, uh, the notion of reconfiguring the role of teachers. And people are talking about this all the time, and there are lots and lots of experiments going on. Uh, but where that's going to sort out, I'm not really sure. I think that there's a lot of, uh, of, of variation in the opinion of how that should go. In the midterm, in the European region, um, and I, I would imagine everyone agree with this, we're going to see a lot more use of open resources and a lot more use of hybrid learning courses that have both an online and an in-presence uh, classroom. That just makes really, really good sense. The long-term trends, uh, the ones that, that we think are going to be around for at least five more years uh, is, number one, the, the continued evolution of online learning. What we're seeing is that we're at the very beginning of this, particularly in Europe, where there are lots of good examples, but we're also seeing a lot of creativity and a lot of innovation. And I think that's going to continue as people get more and more used to how to do online learning. And related to that, very much related to that, is the notion of data-driven learning and assessment, which overlaps very nicely with the concept of hybrid and online learning. So those are how we're thinking some of the trends. Now, in the report, the second chapter looks at the challenges that are facing uh, European schools related to technology. And these <coughs> are things that, if we don't solve them, um, it's going to either slow down the adoption of new ideas and technologies or block them completely. Uh, and again, we're looking specifically in these three areas of policy, leadership, and practice. So well, I should explain these two dimensions here. Whoops. <laughs> so one dimension that we think about with challenges is, are they solvable? Can we solve them? Do we understand them is the second dimension. What are their boundaries? Where, where can we begin to work on them? And some, some challenges, we, we do understand them, and we do have solutions for them. And so that's our first category, where we have both of those dimensions. And the ones that will be identified in the report are things that we can do to integrate ICT into teacher education. The fact is, we know how to do this. We know what to do. We know what the issues are related to it. It's just a matter of political will. To, to do it. It's our own institutions and our own policies that are slowing us down. Uh, not do we know how, we know how. Similarly, and related to this, is the uh, low digital competence of students when they exit the educational system. And again, we understand how to, how to fix that. And so these are both the uh, challenges that can be solved with, with policy solutions. In the middle are solutions you need to be more closer to the microphone. No. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Is it possible to turn the microphone? <laughs> yeah, that would be better. Okay. 
because uh, I can't do the whole thing like this, I'll get it quick in my neck. Uh, <laughs> difficult challenges are challenges that we understand them, but we don't uh, know how to solve them yet. And so there are two that are, uh, that are highlighted in the report in some depth. One is how do we make learning authentic? How do we connect the real world to learning? Well, there's lots of interesting experiments going on with that. A lot of interesting experiments. And so you have inquiry-based learning, problem-based learning, and challenge-based learning, and yada yada hyphen-based learning are all out there. Uh, but to say that we've really solved that, um, we're, we're, far, we're still pretty far from that. And then understanding the relationship between formal and informal learning is another one that we, we understand it on one level. We've measured it. For example, we spend only 12% of our life learning in formal situations in schools and universities. And the other 88% of our life, we spend learning informally from our friends, from our family, from the internet, from our own interests and hobbies, that sort of, that sort of way. And the last group of challenges is uh, one that we call wicked challenges. And these are challenges that we don't understand at all. And we don't have any idea where to start. And in fact, every time we begin to think about it, we learn more about the challenge itself, but not necessarily making much progress. And one of them is understanding how we can bring complex thinking and complex communication more into learning. Um, this is clearly a skill that people in uh, many, many professional fields need, and you know, we don't really know how to, to teach that yet. And then the notion of co-designing learning with students is related to the idea of empowering students to direct their own learning. Um, and we're not really sure how to do that yet either, even though people do really see the benefits. Now, we also look at technologies uh, in the Verizon report quite a bit. And we were, this is Gartner's hype curve um, for last year. And we looked at all of those technologies and quite a few more. Um, in fact, these, I'll show you just the list of our current one. These are learning technologies that we're looking at, but we're also interested in consumer technologies, <coughs> digital strategies. Um, Social media is one that we're very interested in uh, for lots of reasons. The backbone, the basic plumbing of the internet, those sorts of technologies, visualization technologies. Volumetric displays, by the way, is the new name for holograms, in case you didn't know that. And then we follow a whole lot of technologies that, that will never be directly related to learning, but are going to be part of devices like our phones and tablets and, and other things. So that, uh, for example, they just released uh, or invented or in Japan the carbon-carbon batteries, which will charge 22 times faster than a lithium ion and deliver more power. Well, that's going to help teachers because as we move to mobile devices, keeping them charged is a problem. If we're able to do that quicker and faster, that'll, that'll be better. So, that's about as much as I can say and get away with it uh, about the European report, but there'll be a press release announcing it next week, and uh, it looks like it's going to be published in September so that we don't release it into the vacation season here, so you can watch for that. So that's that segment. Now, the, where I wanted to go next is more related to the theme of this conference. And so I recently read this book. I highly recommend it the second machine age. And among the many topics they talk about there is the notion of Moore's Law. So you may not really realize it, but Moore's Law was first illustrated in this paper, published in 1964. So Moore's Law has been in effect for 50 years. Now if you can remember what Moore's Law is about, it's that every 18 months, we see a doubling of capacity and a halving of cost in all sorts of things digital. And in the beginning, it wasn't so significant, but as we move out, and this is just two to the tenth, okay, we're talking 50 years, so this is two to the tenth, it's a thousand times more 
Now, the thing is, is that Moore's Law has been validated over and over and over again. This is the hard drive capacity. Uh, and it's a virtually linear relationship that you can see there. But it's also been demonstrated in supercomputer speed, uh, internet download speeds at homes, microprocessor transistors, hard drive cost and efficiency, and countless other things that are related to hardware. And what they did in the second machine age is they said, well, let's try and make this be understandable where we're really at now, 50 years later. So imagine a chessboard where every square, as you move across it, you double, you know, so that you go. So 50 years divided by 18 months is 32. So we are now at 10 to the 32 since 1964, which means that the next time we double capacity, we're not going to just double it from 2 to 4. We're going to double it from 4 trillion 294 billion to 8.4 trillion. It's the, the impact of this is that we're now in the vertical part of this curve. And the changes that we're going to see in devices are staggering if Moore's Law continues. And pretty much the entire technical industry has agreed that at least for the next five to 10 years, it's going to continue to be in effect. So in the short term, relatively short term, we can expect to see at least four or five, maybe even 10 more doublings of capacity in our devices. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means, well, we can look at what we've already seen. I mean, already you've got phones that respond to text pretty accurately. You've got integrated GPS in your phone. You've got digital video that's amazing. You can do all sorts of photography. It's got an accelerometer. It's got a compass. You know, all of these things fit into, if we took the battery out, something that would be about the size of a euro. That's the entire technology that's in the phone. The rest of it's battery. Um, and screen. So that's the first point that I want to make as we think about the future. The devices that we have in the future are nothing like the devices that we've had in the past. And they're not anything really like the devices we have today. We see the tablet and that's the first wave. But our devices are, well first off, they're not going to have keyboards. They're not going to have mice. Um, those technologies are really old, as I'll show you a little bit. So anyway, let me, let me leave this point for a second, because I want to juxtapose it with our work in the university and our mission, and to think about that. And this goes back a long way. And when I was in graduate school, I studied Jose Ortega Gasset and his famous book about the mission of the university. And when I became a president, it really did inform my thinking quite a bit about what universities were supposed to be about. He boiled it down to a very simple set of three things that universities were meant to do. And they were meant to do this all related to the production of knowledge. So they were intended to conserve knowledge, to create new knowledge by engaging in research, and to pass on the sum of human knowledge to the next generation. That's what he saw as the mission of the university. And I think it's really important to think about it in very simple terms, because today, most people would describe the mission of the university very differently. That is to prepare people for the workforce, or it's to do a whole range of other things that really have nothing to do necessarily with knowledge. But let's go back a little bit in time. This is the very first university. We're, we're in, a, in a place surrounded by Roman walls and ruins were right outside the window here. This is Nalandia University in northern India, and it was founded in the 5th century. This was the first modern university, really the first Western modern university, uh, and it focused on medicine and mathematics. Uh, and they also had a Buddhism department there. Uh, move over to um, Morocco, and you have the University of al Karawin, which was founded in 859, which I think is very interesting to note 
that the founder was Fatima al Fahiri, who was a woman. So in 859, she did this. This particular university is, continues to operate. It is the oldest continuously operating university in the world, according to the Guinness Book. And then on our little tour over to Egypt, Al-Azhar, founded in 970, um, and then a whole uh, series of universities that were the Madrasas i al Nazamiya in Iran. Um, and these were celebrated schools of architecture, engineering, mathematics, and of course religion. They're completely destroyed today, but the ruins that remain show a very high level of attention to detail. The first university in the Western world was the University of Bologna, of course, uh, founded in 1088. And um, this painting is, commemorates that. I think it's very interesting to look at it because it looks just like we are here today. Here I am at the podium. You know, and somebody's on their phone in the back of the room. There's you know, people talking. <laughs> and completely separate conversations, the guys sleep in there. Uh, it looks very much like a modern classroom, particularly you know, at a university with as rich of a, of a connection to history as, as the one we're in, something to think about. So that was 1088. Um, and at the same time, the Sorbonne was founded in Paris and uh, the University of Oxford was founded. Um, and since then, which I might point out is just under a thousand years. Uh, things have proceeded in pretty much a very similar fashion pedagogically. Uh, we found a nice model and, and we continue to implement it quite a bit. And that's an easy thing to, to say and poke fun at, at universities. Um, but even as our, as our processes have stayed by and large very similar to the way they were almost a thousand years ago, the leadership challenges today are very different. And so when you look at universities around the world, many of them have serious political um, realities. For example, the University of Cairo is closed right now because it's not safe to go to school in Cairo today, in public universities. And uh, the government doesn't want the kinds of things that happen at universities to be going on right now. So they are forced to move completely online learning. Uh, but most universities don't have to deal with that. They have their own political realities, and Catalonia is certainly a place that knows a lot about that. Uh, but common sorts of challenges are how to attract and retain the right faculty and teachers and students, how to deal with the pressures of uh, political leaders in society to shift the mission and focus of our institutions, how to stand out. There are tens of thousands of universities in the world. How does yours stand out in all of this? Competition from the private sector, for-profit universities like Phoenix and others that are really looking to have a global presence in what they call the marketplace. Um, and then within our institutions, we have serious challenges as well. The expectations that will have shared governance and transparency are, are part of the academic world. And when they're out of kilter, it, it really does stop a lot of processes <coughs> in university. And finally, I'll just point out one, and that's the changing demographics and needs of students. As the middle class has grown around the world, we have a very different looking sort of uh, student population now. They're prepared in a much more uneven way. Uh, some of them have very difficult challenges with math and writing and such things. Uh, but more than that, something that uh, John Daniels has, has spoken about, so I'm going to attribute this to, to him because it's a pretty prescient. Right now we have 156 million higher education students in the world. 156 million. By the year 2025, 11 years from now, that number is expected to grow to 225 million. Okay, well, that sounds, it's a big world, right? 225 million. So how do we address the 75 million new students? You would have to build 
four new universities every week, each one of them serving 30,000 students to absorb 75 million people in the next 11 million, in the next 11 years. It's 11 million years, we might take it. But, uh, it's a giant, giant challenge that nobody's talking about, is where will those students go and how will we meet their needs and how is that going to change the university? Well, it's going to change it a lot because either it's going to be a bunch of unhappy people running around that can't get in or we're going to see new models of education coming out that are very, very different than what we are seeing today. Um, and I happen to think it's going to be the second one. So what that means is, in my view, I see some big changes coming in the next 10 years um, to education. So that's point number two. And point number three, I want to use a, a photographic metaphor. I'm, I'm a photographer. I took this picture in Jackson Hole. If you're um, an American photographer of any skill, eventually you will go to Jackson Hole and take this picture. This is called the Mormon Barn. It's Grand Teton behind it. And it's about 5.45 in the morning when I took this photograph. And it's beautiful. It's a quintessential American West. But it only tells part of the story. In fact, it tells a story that really doesn't even pertain to the reality. This is the reality. There were 50 other photographers standing there, all of us shivering and cold in the dark. The sun had not even come up. The reason why you were able to see it like this is because it's a long exposure. And so I let more light in the camera than you could actually see. It was actually dark. And I like to use this metaphor because sometimes we just need to turn around and be sure that we're looking at everything to make sure we're understanding the circumstance. And, and so this is my third point. Because I think that our strategic thinking across all of the academy is based on a world that, that doesn't exist anymore. It's based on the world that we lived in, past tense. And we were very successful. That's how we got our jobs. We we're good at it. But what we we're good at is not the challenges that we're going to face going forward. That experience, by and large, isn't going to help us to solve things. So to illustrate that, I want to tell you a little story, and I've got about 10 minutes left, so we'll tell it fairly quickly. But I'm going to use uh, the network as, a, as one technology that we could think about, and I'm going to use four generations of my own family to tell this story. So this is my mom. Ten minutes, see it. <laughs> my watch is a little fast. That's my mom, and that's my granddaughter. So that's four generations of my family in that picture. That's the moment that they met. And, uh, so initially, when my mom was young, the idea of the network, it was new. It looked like this. And the idea was that the network connected us. The radio network connected us. And the country would sit around, it was the Depression. People had trouble, they didn't have money, there were no jobs, it was a lot like it is in Spain in 2014, sadly. And President Roosevelt got on the radio, fireside chats every Saturday, and would talk to the nation, and people would sit around their radios. Now, at this time, my dad became a soldier. And, and this is a picture of him when he was young man. Remember, this was a time of great hardship. Um, this famous picture from Dorothea Lange um, really illustrates the tragedy of the Great Depression, I think, in a way that uh, I choke up still when I see it. It's a phenomenal photograph. Um, that was the era that they were raised in. They were raised in an era of, of deprivation, an era of scarcity. And so when someone was innovative and wanted to learn about technology, they had to do a lot themselves. And, and when my dad was young, he was enamored with this technology. Does anybody know what this is? I built a bunch of them when I was a kid. It's a radio. You would never think today that a radio is something you could just go in your garage and build. And you could listen to the radio. And it cost us maybe a buck. To, you know, to buy the parts to, to put it together. A lot of it was handmade. This particular one is an AM-FM radio. 
the cups had the crystals in there. And, uh, and so my dad loved this, and his whole career was devoted to it and in the military state, radar and, and all the implications of radar. He knew a lot about radio, and he kept after his whole life at a very high level. And he loved to explain to me things like, we need to get up in the middle of the night because we're living right now, and we lived in Africa at the time, and the prize boxing match between Sonny Liston and Cassius Clay was going to happen, the very first one before he became Muhammad Ali. And he was explaining, well, you know, the reason why we want to listen to it at night is because radio waves travel further at night. And while they may replay it in the daytime, we won't get to hear it because the radio waves don't travel all the way from the U.S. to, to where we were in Africa and so forth. And we, you know, we just really went deep on it. That was my dad's technology. Now, I, as I grew up, and someone made a comment last night, I miss the days when we all watch TV together. Well, that was my youth, okay? This is my family here. It's, it's really, uh, the, you know, the Nelsons, uh, you know, or I remember uh, shows like in America, the Beverly Hillbillies. Let me tell you all the story about a man named Jeff. <laughs> Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. This was the network for me. But as I came of age in high school, there began to be some mentions of the dark side, that it wasn't all connecting and all good. Marshall McLuhan, the great Canadian researcher, began thinking about what are the implications? How is this changing us? And, and a new view of the network came out, that in fact, yeah, it's connecting us, but at the same time, it's changing us, and we're not real sure if that's a good thing. And I experienced that twice in my life. One was uh, this moment, which was Walter Cronkite, who uh, was a trusted American newscaster back in November of 1963. And he had just received a handwritten note that said that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated in Dallas. And so he paused and took his glasses off. Well, for me, as a, as a teenager in high school, I witnessed the entire nation, and indeed much of the world, stop for three days. Together, we watched Harvey Oswald get shot. Up, you know, millions and millions and millions and millions of people, and that had never really ever happened before. Uh, and it really did change us. And then in 1968, the Chicago riots outside the Democratic Convention changed us even more. And this was the year that I went to university. And I was really enamored with this man. And I'm just going to play just 30 seconds of it. I'm going to get back here. All right, and I'll play the video. We're going to try our best to show you rather than tell you about this program. A very essential part of what we have developed technologically is what does come through this display to us. And I'm going to start out without telling you very much about the program, just run through a little bit of the action that this provides us. Okay, so talk about control devices. We'll use this overhead camera shot. And you can see the devices that I'm using. I use three and they're not all standard. We have a playing device called our mouse, a standard keyboard, and a special key set we have here. And we're going to go for a picture down in our laboratory and then we'll fire can type it up. that will show you from another point of view more about how that mouse works. Come in, then we'll fire. It's like a science fiction movie, doesn't it? Okay, there's Don Andrew's hand, and then we'll fire. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working. And the way the tracking slot moves in conjunction with the movement of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way, and we never did change it. So that was 1968, 45 years ago. That's when the mouse and the graphic user interface was invented. This is called the mother of all demos. Um, Doug Engelbart demoed the mouse, the graphic user interface, the network, hyperlinks, two-way video conferencing, and a long list of other technologies that we're still taking for granted today. 
But my point here is that the graphic user interface and the mouse are 50, almost 50 years old. Um, but there was another notion in Engelbart's uh, message, and that was that the network helps us. It augments us. It, it increases our ability to be productive. Um, and that's, that's an important point that has been part of my career the whole time. I'm about five minutes out. I show I've got 37 minutes behind me. And we're cognizant that we started 30 minutes late, but we're going to end early. Okay? So just letting you know. Um, anyway, so, you know, I'm thinking about these ideas, and, I, and I've talked to my son. So now we're in the third generation. I don't know about your kids, but my son is very comfortable telling me when he thinks I'm full of it. And in this case, he says, Dad, that's, that's a fascinating story. I really like it, but you don't have it right at all. It isn't about connecting us or helping us or <coughs> changing us. You're not thinking about it right because the network is us. We're the network. And I went, my head blew completely off because I'd never really thought about it that way. I was limited by my own experience, which was building a network that was intended to help us share files and, and do things and all of that. And I wasn't really thinking about his world of the network, where the entire reason the network existed was to connect us to each other. The C in the ICT. I was always focused on the I. And I began thinking about it, and he was right, you know, the news is captured by us. We're, the, we're now the news bureaus. Any breaking news story is captured by this. I'll give you a couple quick examples. This is the first photograph from Haiti after the earthquake a few years ago. And then, I think we all remember this. This is the Facebook page. We are all Khalid Saeed, and it was put up to commemorate a, a young Tunisian who set himself on fire in protest against the government there. Uh, and this was put up as a memorial uh, to him. And within two weeks, it had 450,000 followers. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. Facebook was still relatively new. This was December 17th, 2010, when the young man emulated himself. By the 1st of January, there were 450,000 people. And two weeks after that, they filled Tahir Square. And two weeks or three weeks after that, they toppled a government. And the whole world was watching. And then skip forward a little bit later, two years, and the day the internet went black, when in the States, the US Senate and the House wanted to pass a law that seemed good on the surface to protect privacy, but uh, it had ramifications that really troubled anybody that really understood how the internet worked. And the laws went away overnight. They just stopped talking about it. It never went to a vote. It just got, it just went away. And people went, wow, what just happened? And you spin forward a little bit more, just one more year, and all of a sudden, this guy shows up. And using the internet in a whole other kind of way, um, you know, to, to communicate to the world, uh, things that he was troubled about, and whatever you think about Edward Snowden, uh, the fact that he was able to capture the attention of the entire world, I think is self-evident, and he used social networks to do that. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means the network represents something very, very different than what my parents thought it did, what I thought it did. It's come to represent freedom of speech, of thought, of religion, of expression, Freedom of assembly. The internet's at the root of that today. And kids today have seen it several times, time and again, where things happen through social media. So this is the world that we live in today. It's a complex world, but it's really connected. It's connected in ways that are, from my experience, completely new, completely Unexpected effects come from those connections. So I'm back to where I started with William Gibson. And what I realized in that conversation with my son is that, yeah, the future's already here. 
it was unevenly distributed, and as much as I was involved in technology, a life built around technology, I realized, wait a minute, I'm not in the part that's really relevant. I need to think about it differently. You know, we live in a world where I was walking through the, I was in Paris earlier in the week, and I'm not bragging, but it was very nice. And, <laughs> and I'm walking down the street, and you know, this guy's just having a video call, just walking down the street, and, you know, it's just like it's like a common thing every day. This is the kind of connections that people have all the time without even thinking about it. And so as we're doing our planning, as we're writing this document, this communication that commemorates 300 years of Catalonia and lays out some expectations for the future, what my gut tells me is we need to ask ourselves, are we building radios? Are we really thinking about the world as it going to be? You know, is this the education system that we're wanting to promote? Or are we thinking about a world where even babies use devices completely intuitively, where devices don't come with instruction manuals anymore because they're so easy? We grew up in a world where technology was hard. They grew up in a world where they're doing it when they're, when they're teeny. You know, and we talk about e-learning, and, and I have to ask myself, why is it focused on electronic learning? Why is that special? Why shouldn't it be in-learning for, like, engaging learning? Or awesome learning? Or excellent learning? You know, that's what we, we should rename this stuff. We're, we're our own worst enemies here. So, I'm going to leave you with this thought, you know, the purpose of teaching, the reason why we're doing this, going back to Jose Ortega Gasset, is we're communicating to future generations all the sum of human knowledge. That's what we're about. And when we do it, we want this to happen. We want to make their mouths drop. Because the world is so cool. The people that can do it, are the people that are here in this room. So as you work in your groups, as you plan on it, think about the world as it really is. Thank you very much.